So today we're talking about evangelism. What is evangelism? Oh, I want to hear all about that. Yeah. So the question, um, the person that asked me this question um, said to me, you know, what, what are we supposed to do with this concept of evangelism when we're not evangelicals? That there are all these assumptions about what evangelism is within our culture that comes from a particular strand of Christianity that is unfamiliar in some ways and in some ways even perhaps diametrically opposed to um, some of the beliefs that we hold as mainline Christians. And so Katie, what are we supposed to do with this? Yes. I have heard that the congregational church invented evangelism and it's got so much baggage that we don't even touch it a hundred years later. I think, I think I could say that. Yeah, I don't know that they invented it. I mean, they invented it based in terms of, of evangelism, of, yeah. You know what it's like today. Um, but the interesting thing is, um, you know, we we are Lutherans, and our denomination is the ELCA, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. And yes. So, what does that mean, and how do we deal with you know that that baggage from within our denomination and from within our, um, you know, position theologically. So I, I, I am going to make an assumption and assume that all of you are bringing some assumptions about evangelicalism and even and evangelism with you today. So I wanted to give you a chance just to, you know, today to share some of your assumptions. Um, my assumption, you know, my, my fundamental assumption with this question is that there is something wrong with the way that our society understands Christian evangelism, that there is something um, there, there, there are, that the way it has developed is um, incorrect in some way or inappropriate, or, um, you know, like I said, opposed to what we understand to be um, who God is and who we are supposed to be in relationship to God and each other. So that's my assumption. But what uh, you know, when, when I when I bring up that even that word evangelism, what kind of pops into your head? What are some of the assumptions and and kind of the baggage that you carry? Well, I don't carry Jimmy Swagger baggage. <laughs> well, plead, plead, plead my guilt to everybody. <laughs> I I tend to think. See Lutherans as more very conservative in their evangelism approach than uh, people that I would consider part of evangelical churches. You know, we're not out there going door to door, sitting up there with brochure stands, <laughs> trying to trying to talk to strangers. Uh -huh. Tend to be one on one if that opportunity even arises for us. Okay. So not much into the evangelism thing at least in terms of what we assume evangelism to be well you know most of the people that i've come in contact with who um who put themselves in that category of being evangelical and even though it's in our the name of our church i don't think that it means the same thing that they do when they say it mm. and i often think that they um rely too much on set phrases and rote memory of bible verses i mean you know they i don't know exactly how to put it but it doesn't always sound sincere mm. to me and I always wonder what their what their game is. Are they really trying to win people to Christ, or are they making themselves feel better mm. by assuming they're good? Interesting. interesting. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, interesting. It really seems to me that the best way to be to evangelize is to set an example. Mm -hmm. and, and not go out and, and try and talk to people earnestly and seriously like 
like you're kind of better than they are. I just don't think that feels right. Mm, okay. I agree. I, ha I have had an uncle that I really loved, but he, you almost didn't want to get into a conversation with him about anything that would allow him to um, evangelize. And because once he did, it was like he had a script in his head that he had to follow and you couldn't get away from him until he was done with his script. Mm. And um, I know he was sincere, but he was also really boring. <laughs> <laughs> could put me to sleep because he never stopped he just went on and on and on until he had done all of his whatever it was mm -hmm. <laughs> there's a judgmentalism that seems to come into some yeah efforts. Mm -hmm. yeah are there jehovah's witnesses around here i haven't had any come to my door since i've moved here that's because you live Arbet. out in the there are beds <laughs> it's hot yeah they don't want to they don't want to go door to door yeah at first we we lived um right down the street from the church so i i expected that we would see some people but we never did during the they're 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 in a um a holding pattern due to covid right they're now. not going door to door they're, they're, they're doing other things I've, i i know some jehovah's witnesses and that's something that they put on pause oh, okay. are jehovah's witnesses the people that are down in front of turtle bay maybe not right now, but a year ago, there were some people that were always sitting there with pamphlets and ready to talk to you. Probably. Probably them. Yeah, pamphlets. And they have the Watchtower and Awake magazine. Yes, the Watchtower. Yeah. Well, there's also people outside the library sometimes, and I don't, I don't know that they're Jehovah Witness. They might be Mormon. There's also a lot of bums in front of the library. <laughs> no, not anymore. <laughs> so can you tell the difference? No. <laughs> so, the difference of a Mormon and a Jehovah Witness? And a homeless person. <laughs> well, the, the, Mormon, the Mormon guys that come around are usually guys on missions and they're wearing the dark pants and the white shirts. Yeah. And yeah, and a tie. They don't, they don't seem to be stymied, stymied by the heat because I've had the I've actually saw one that was so bright red. I said, "Sit down, and I'm giving you water." Oh wow! <laughs> and wow, oh. those witnesses tend to always have. They tend to be dressed very nicely. Yeah, and usually aren't by themselves, but they can be. That was and very they, evangelical of you. I think you did a good deed. That's just that's just being a nice. <laughs> Well, I I'm, think that's the point. I think that's the my, point. My mother, my mother would debate the Jehovah's Witness guy that would come by in, in San Diego, and many a time I'd come home from school, and she'd be in this debate with this guy, old guy with a brown suit, and he'd be there, you know, two or three times a year, and she'd be debating him. And so I never, I don't turn him away. I have discussions with him. Yeah, I yeah. miss my Jehovah's Witnesses in New Jersey. They would come, I would say, at least once every other week. And, and knock on my door to my apartment and I was always yeah. there because I couldn't find a job at the time. Bob was working at the bank so he was never home. And I mean if you take the awake and the watchtower they're, they're interesting they're interesting readings doesn't mean you have to believe it but you get to see what a different person's perspective is on it and the only one that I've ever stopped dead in their tracks was when I said okay 144,000 people get into heaven but if somebody new comes along that gets really good <laughs> they bumped George Washington or what? <laughs> George Washington wasn't a Jehovah's Witness. He doesn't get in. <laughs> I wasn't going to say Michael Jackson. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, to give us um, kind of some to start to start us off on this topic, I wanted to try something new this week. I want to show you a video. And this video comes from a series of videos that were produced in the early 2000s. So it's a little bit dated, um, but it's, um, it stars Rob Bell. You may remember him. He was um, uh, one of those evangelical pastors that started saying things that the main, you know, the, 
the, the standard evangelicals didn't like. And so he became you know, this very contentious figure. Um, and so I wanted to share this video with you. Um, it's called Bullhorn. And I have never shown a video that's embedded in PowerPoint on a Zoom before. So hopefully you'll be able to see and hear. Can everybody see my black box? It's a yes. black box, yes. Yeah. Okay, so as soon as I hit my arrow button here, hopefully it'll start. And if you can't hear, kind of wave your hand or give me a thumbs okay. up if you can or something and we can try to work it out. Okay. Here we go. So we've got music going now. Can you hear that? Very, yeah, very faint. Is anybody talking, Katie? No. Okay. He looks like he's up to no good. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's left for the day. It's 520. Yep. Stereotypical. Shredding. Oh. Mm -hmm. That's a folding machine. A folding, okay. It looks like a toaster, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to see a band with my friends, and we're walking into the venue. And up ahead on the sidewalk out front is this guy. He's got one of those bullhorns. He's yelling all this stuff. And at first, I can't hear what he's saying. But as I get closer, I hear the word sin and burn and hell and repent. And then I hear the word Jesus. He's got all these pamphlets. And he's quoting these Bible verses about the anger and wrath of God. And how if I don't repent, I'm going to pay for it for eternity. And, and how I might die. I might die tonight. This might be my only chance. And then I might spend forever in misery as I burn in hell. And no one is stopping to hear more and no one wants any of his pamphlets so i want to talk to the bullhorn guy bullhorn guy i don't think it's working all the yelling and the judgment and the condemnation i don't think it's working i actually think it's making things worse i don't think it's what jesus had in mind and see see bullhorn guy you're confusing for my friends and I because some are Christians and some aren't but we just don't get it we just don't understand what all the condemning and, and the converting we don't understand what it has to do with Jesus message and, and to be honest it's confusing for me because you and I end up getting painted with the same brush I mean, didn't Jesus say that he came to save not to condemn like that story in the Bible, the book of John, where that woman is caught in adultery and the religious leaders like drag her in in front of Jesus and they've essentially condemned her to die. And, and what does Jesus say to her? He says to her, I don't condemn you. I mean, that, that's why so many of us are so fascinated with Jesus because he never stops insisting that God really, really loves us exactly as we are. I mean, isn't that what draws you to him? That's what draws me. And see, all I can figure out, Bullhorn Guy, is that you think you're giving people the good news. But the problem is, it doesn't come across that way. It doesn't appear very loving. And when Jesus is asked, what's the most important thing? Jesus' response is to love, love God with everything that you have and then love those around you in the same kind of way. Jesus doesn't separate loving God and loving others. For Jesus, everything hangs on these two. So the defining mark of a Christian is love. Like this writer John in the Bible writes a series of letters to some of the first Christians, and in one of them he says this. He says, if you say that you love God and you don't love the people around you, then you're a liar. It's almost, uh, it's almost as if John says, that how you love others, that's how you love God. There's this great passage in the Bible, 
this one writer, he says like, I can say all these great things, but if I don't have love, I'm like a gong or a clanging cymbal. And see, Bullhorn Guy, this is why the yelling and the bullhorn are so disturbing to us, is it seems like you're just trying to convert people to your religion. Like they're notches on some sort of spiritual belt, but they're not. They're, they're people. They're people that God loves. They're the people that Jesus wants us to love. They aren't statistics. They aren't numbers. They aren't possible conversions. I mean, they're, if, if I'm loving somebody with an agenda, then it isn't really love, is it? Because God loves everybody. And any movement that isn't about love, that isn't of God, I mean, any movement that hates or marginalizes or oppresses anybody, anywhere, no matter what it says or what's in its name, Jesus doesn't want any part of it. So a Christian is somebody who understands this, who understands that people, different perspectives and different religious beliefs and convictions, they're to be loved and respected because they're made by God and they're sacred and they're valuable and they matter. God loves the world. So a Christian does too. That doesn't mean that I have to agree with everybody, like I can't have a spine or something. I mean, we speak our minds and we take action against things that we think are wrong, but we do it with love and with respect because Jesus said to love your enemies. And when we love our enemies, something powerful happens, doesn't it? Something transforming, something, something that can't be denied. It's like we have this internal compass that tells us what love is, don't we? We know it when we see it. I mean, love wins. We just know when somebody's doing something out of love. See, God loves everybody, you and me and ax murderers and child molesters. And God loves people who don't even think that God exists. And some people think that God only loves them and God loves them too. And some people think that they're right and everybody else is wrong. And God loves them too. God loves everybody. Like the writer James says in the Bible, God shows no favoritism. And see, poor Hong guy, there's so much that you can do, that we can do to, there's so much good we can do to help. I mean, there's so many people who just need somebody to listen, not to preach to them and not to try to convert them, but just to listen, to listen to their story and, and to listen to their pain and to listen to their dreams. And, and there are so many other, there's so many people who have like really basic needs like food and clothing and shelter and medicine. And, and we have the resources to help them. And didn't Jesus say that when we do that, when we look out for each other, that he's there some sort of mysterious way. I mean, how we love others is how we love God. And see, Bullhorn Guy, that's why the hellfire and brimstone stuff is so dangerous. When you tell me that I should follow Jesus so that I don't burn forever, it sounds like a threat. As if like you scare people enough, they'll all of a sudden magically decide to love God and follow Jesus. But that isn't what Jesus did. Jesus went around inviting people into the best possible kind of life. I mean, at one point he even says, I've come that, that you might have life and have it to the fullest. You just don't find Jesus waving heaven in front of people with some sort of carrot on a stick. So 
Bullhorn guy, I'm asking you in love on behalf of all of us. I'm tired of it. We're all tired of it. I think, I think Jesus is tired of it. But maybe you're a Christian and you're sitting there nodding and you're agreeing with me and you're going, yeah, you tell them it's about time somebody said that. But, but what are you doing to change the perception? Because that's what it is. It's a perception among many that being a Christian is lame. When you ask a lot of people, what's it mean to be a Christian? And they give you long lists of things that have nothing to do with following Jesus. You can say the name Christian and for a lot of people, it instantly drags up all sorts of negative stereotypes and adjectives and images. And my question is this, how? How did the best message ever, this beautiful life of love and hope and peace, how did it ever get turned into something else? And how did so few end up speaking for so many? See, there are massive numbers of us all over the place who are serious about following Jesus, who actually believe him when he says that he came to bring us life and life to the full. We want the best possible life here and now, the kind that goes on forever, the kind that Jesus invites us to. And so we're pursuing it and we're learning how to live it. And we're learning how to love people, not because we're trying to get them into our little club and not because we want everybody to be the same, but because this is what Jesus teaches us to do. So may you see that how you love others is how you love God. That's it. That's, that's the way of love. That's the way of Jesus. All right. Thoughts? Well, Katie, when we were in Ecuador a couple of years ago, we were in a town square and there was an evangelist. We could tell. I think he was not speaking English, but we knew what he was saying. And everybody was avoiding him, especially our guide. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. so who are they evangelizing to, the believers or the non-believers? I think the non-believers, but it, they have to decide, you know, they, they decide who the non-believers are. Well, the bullhorn guy really has to believe in what he's doing or he wouldn't. Yeah, that's embarrassing. <laughs> Stand out there with your bullhorn screaming at people and everybody avoids you and walks to the other side of the street. They obviously aren't embarrassed by it though. So it might be, maybe they, they see it like they're fishing. <laughs> Maybe. Ah, yes, pictures of men. Mm -hmm. When my daughter was in college, she spent a summer in Argentina. She was part of Campus Crusade um, at Sac State. And um, she spent the summer traveling from one little village to another with uh, the Jesus film. And it was about the life of Jesus. And they went from one village to another and showed the movie and talked to people and stuff like that. And um, I don't know that they saved anybody or anything, but um, they met a lot of nice people and got fed really well. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't, I mean, she looked on it as a positive experience. So um, she also did a summer at Lake Tahoe, basically doing the same thing and handing out pamphlets and stuff. And nobody would pay any attention to them at all. Mm -hmm. But the people in Argentina were just happy to have the company, I think. So it seems like a Hell's Angels camp would be a perfect place to do that. <laughs> But that takes in my assumptions about the Hell's Angels. So that's that's an issue say, altogether. I bet a lot of them are already Christian. Yeah. But they're older now, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. 
I think Steve asked a good question, you know, like who are they, who are they preaching to? Well, there's a bunch of us people that think we're Christians that really aren't, according to evangelicals. Yes. So I think they're trying to get us. Like my brother-in-law tried so hard to straighten me out, and I think they gave up a couple of years ago. So, but he tried so hard. He's still lecturing me, but it, it's it's sideways thing, not direct right now. So. I know that's what my uncle did too. Yes, I'm not sure. Uh, yes, yeah, Steve. I was gonna, are there some church denominations that are like on the extreme end where they do this, but if you're not in their church, you're not you're not getting it. Versus yeah, some that's, that just um, out there and that's, talk about. That's not the extreme end, Steve. That's that's pretty standard. Um, in my experience, the the denominations, most of the denominations that I grew up in with the church hopping that we did um, had that position, particularly the uh, church that we kind of landed in, the Presbyterian Church in America, which is kind of like the LCMS version of, of the Presbyterians. They broke off over women's ordination. And yeah, they their, their position is that if you, um, you know, if you aren't of them, if, then you're not chosen. You're not one of God's people. And so you're not going to get in. Okay. So, yeah. Um, uh, it all depends on your denomination and what your particular church teaches, but it, there's always something that you must do. You know, you must say this particular sinner's prayer. You must take this action. You must join this denomination. You, you know, all these different things. Um, but it, it kind of brings us around then to, I think, what, what Rob was trying to get at, which is about love. And But then we have to ask the question, you know, what is love? Because I, I think, you know, we, we, we kind of alluded to this earlier, somebody said about it, that are these people earnest? Are they genuine? You know, when you, when you stand there with your bullhorn, and then somebody actually comes up to you miraculously and wants to hear what you have to say, even though you've got this script in your head that comes across as so false, so rehearsed, are, is your heart in it? Do you really, you know, do you really believe, really believe that this person that you're speaking to is going to spend eternity in hell if you don't get through to them? And you've been taught that this is the best way to do that. And so you're going to do whatever you can to save this person. Because from that perspective, I can understand that they would equate something like that with love. But if, you know, but if it's just a, a notch in, the, in the, the spiritual belt for them or for their denomination or bringing in more money for their church or, you know, more, more behind in the seats or whatever it is, then you know, I think that's a completely different story. Um, but to me, I think the hellfire and brimstone and the screaming and the bullhorning and equating that with love is doing spiritual damage, doing psychological damage, not just to the people that are being yelled at, but to the person who's doing the yelling because they are taught that what they are doing is love. That what they're doing is God's will, that that the only way to save people is to, to scare them. And they live in fear too. They don't even recognize it. I know because I spent the first 17, 18 years of my life living that way, living in that fear. So I want to talk about the background of this word evangelism a little bit. At its most basic, evangelism means good news. It is a combination of two Greek words. A or U means good, and angelion means message. And you can see in there the word angel that we get. Um, and we, you know, we've kind of turned that into the little blonde haired, blue eyed creatures with the, with the pretty wings and the gold uh, 
you know, the gold dresses and, and all that. Um, but an angel is at its most fundamental, just a messenger. We don't know what it, what an angel looks like. Um, an angel doesn't need to look like any particular thing. A lot of times in the Bible, um, angels appear, see, seem to appear as humans. Um, so that's, that's where we get that word. So the evangelion is at its most fundamental, a good message or good news. Um, over the course of time, the meaning of the word kind of started to, to shift. And by the New Testament period, by the Roman period, it referred to a weighty, royal, authoritative, and official message. So you would get um, royal decrees that would go out that would be the good news of Julius Caesar, Caesar Augustus. And it would tell you about his um, about his, his military conquests would usually be what it was about. Um, and this, this political and military connotation um, comes from the, because we've got this, um, you know, Engelion message, messenger thing. Um, when soldiers would go out to battle, the people who were left at home would have to just wait for a report from the battlefield about the outcome of the battle. You know, there weren't cell phones or, um, anything like that. They didn't even have, you know, flags that they could you know, send a message quickly or, or anything like that. And so once the outcome of the battle was known, once it, you know, either seemed obvious what was going to happen in the battle or the battle was finished, um, marathon runners would be sent back to the city or the, the country or wherever it was to report about what happened in the battle. And so they would have these, these runners that were officially, that was their job was to run. And then there would be watch people, watchmen in the, in the watchtower and they would watch into the horizon as far as they could see. And then they would, they, before they could even see the runner himself they would see the dust moving. And they knew that the runner was on the way to give the report. And the watchmen actually over time were able to learn how to tell whether the news was going to be good or bad based on the dust, based on the way the, the runner's legs were churning on the ground and how the dust blew up, whether the news was going to be good or bad. If the runner was kind of, you know, doing um, what, what you might call like the survival shuffle, um, then the dust would come up differently and it would indicate a grim report because if the best you can send is somebody who's been injured um, or is not interested in giving the report because they don't want to know, you know, they don't, don't want anybody to know about what happened or they're, they are afraid of what's going to come if they give the bad report, then that means bad news. But if his legs were flying and the dust was kicking up, then they knew that good news was on the way. They were eager to get there and give it. And so the concept of the evangelion of, of the evangelism of evangelism comes from this. This is kind of the most basic use of this um, term within the, the New Testament period. Um, so then when um, the Anglo-Saxons in Britain were defeated and converted to Christianity, they took this term, evangelion, and they translated it into their own language. And so they used the words God spell, God meaning good and spell meaning story. And so over the course of time, because of how it's, it's difficult to say God spell, God spell, so the, the D dropped out and our modern word in English is gospel. So gospel is actually the same word as evangelism or even evangelion, this, this good news, it's just in a different language. So if this is kind of the fundamental understanding of what even evangelism is, then what's the deal with, you know, the, all these assumptions that we make about how people have to respond and, and the, you know, the, the intended outcome. If evangelism is just itself, you know, sharing of the good news, then, then how do we get all this extra baggage? And I think that the, the problem is that we equate in our culture evangelism with proselytization. Evangelism, like I just said, is just basically sharing, sharing good news. 
But proselytization has a purpose. The purpose is to convert, recruit, make someone into a proselyte. And a proselyte is, um, is a neophyte or a disciple, someone who has come over is what that word means in its translation. So how do these two concepts kind of meld together into what I guess today we would call evangelicalism? And I think um, we can blame it in some ways on the Bible and, um, and reading the Bible out of context. So I wanna take a look here at um, Romans chapter 10. And it, it's very interesting today, there are three different places where we are looking at chapter 10 of a particular book. So I don't know what, if that's some kind of weird sign, if you're into that numerology thing or not, but today we're gonna look at Romans 10, Matthew 10 and Luke 10. So starting with Romans 10. Anybody interested in reading verses 10 through 17 for us? You can read it out of your own Bible or you can read it off the screen. That's the whole thing on the screen? Yep. I'll read it. Thanks. Get the lighting just right. All right. For one believes with the heart in and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one whom they have, they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all have obeyed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed in our message? So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. Okay. So this passage, just as it stands, seems to indicate what? How are you saved? By people who are sent to tell you the good news. Mm -hmm. because you have to call in the name of the Lord. But how can you call if you don't believe? And how can you believe if you haven't heard of it? And how can you hear of it if no one comes to tell you? And so the idea being that if those who already believe don't go out and share the good news with others, then all those other people who haven't heard can't be saved. And so what happens to them if they're not saved? Well, we're not sure. But the assumption, because this says very specifically, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, but it doesn't say what happens to everybody else. But what say, about- Well, you must call on the name of the Lord to be saved. What about the faith in the things seen and unseen? Mm, okay, interesting. So there are uh, contradictions elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, I think there there's a way for for God to touch that spot in you that would allow you to believe in something you've never seen or heard. Okay, so we've got another spot that kind of talks a little bit about that. That is our next quote that I want to bring up from, um, this is still within Romans, but this is from chapter two, because so if, if you hear the message and you believe it and you call in the name of the Lord, then you're saved. This, that's what this particular passage says. But how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? How are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? But not all have obeyed the good news for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So there's this problem 
that you know some people are hearing it but what about those who've never heard so romans 2 verses 14 to 16 tell us when gentiles who do not possess the law do instinctively what the law requires these though not having the law are a law to themselves they show that what the law requires is written on their hearts to which their own conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts will accuse or perhaps excuse them on the day when according to my gospel god through jesus christ will judge the secret thoughts of all so this is telling us that gentiles who don't know what god wants them to do who have not heard of God and, and God's love for us and God's goodness and don't follow God's law from understanding what it is, but do instinctively what the law requires. So kind of being good people, right? Even outside of this particular faith. They show that what the law requires is written on their hearts and their conscience bears witness. And so their thoughts will perhaps or perhaps excuse them on the day when God will judge the secret thoughts of all. So isn't that interesting that we've got this one place that says that you must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and how can you confess if you don't hear and how can you hear if no one tells you? But then it also says that those who have not heard could perhaps be excused if they are you know, good people, if they're kind of already doing what God wants them to do without even knowing of God, without having ever heard. So I think a lot of this, you know, kind of pulled out of context is about our need for a fair God, you know, quote unquote fair um, from, from a very childish perspective. You know, is, is it fair that people who have never heard of God would be condemned? If we assume that you must, you know, that Jesus is the only way to heaven, I am the way, the truth, the life. If you assume that the only way to Jesus is to declare your faith in Jesus, and you, we assume that the only way to know that you need to do that is to be told about it, what about people who aren't told? What about people who've never heard? So we need, we need God to be fair. And I have a kind of humorous story um, that was told in a, in a novel, or not a novel, a, a kind of... Um, memoir, I guess, um, by Annie Dillard, who was a, a kind of famous writer. Um, she wrote that she heard this story somewhere. She can't remember where she heard it, but she heard this story. An Inuit hunter asked the local missionary priest, if I did not know about God and sin, would I go to hell? No, said the priest, not if you did not know. The Inuit earnestly replied, then why did you tell me? Oh, wow. <laughs> so, you know, kind of kind of a, a tongue in cheek in a little bit, but also, you know, kind of makes a point. If, if we believe this, if we believe that those who haven't heard have a chance, because it's not fair, and we believe, but we also believe this other thing that, you know, you, you must call on the name of the Lord if you know about it, then telling people kind of puts this impetus on them and now they've got to be worried. They've got to fear for their eternal souls and make sure that they're doing the right thing and saying the right words and, and going to the right church so that they can feel assured of their salvation. So I think what it comes down to at the end of the day is our, you know, our own worry, our own, our own concern, our, our need for certainty about our own salvation. If the rule is this, and I follow that rule, then I'm good to go. That, that helps me. That makes sense that, that, you know, that, that takes care of the problem that I'm having. But if that's true of me and I'm a good person, then I also have to make that true of other people and make sure that they know that they've got to do the same thing as me. Cause I don't, you know, I want them to, to be in heaven. I don't want my loved ones to, to be in hell. And I don't want, you know, other, other human beings that I meet to be in hell because I didn't, I didn't tell them I didn't do the right thing. But I think the problem with all of this is that we are reading this stuff out of context. The specific context for this Romans 10 passage is within a very famous um, kind of 
I don't I don't know what to, what to call it. Um, Paul Paul writes. He's kind of even struggling with himself or trying to convince his his readers, his his listeners, the people that he's writing to. He's trying to explain to them and figure out what is going to happen to the Jews who do not accept Jesus. And this is a very new problem in the, for him. When he started out on his mission, he was convinced that as soon as he told anybody within Judaism that he, he has learned who the Messiah is and it was this Jesus and this is what happened to him. And so now, you know, God has finally fulfilled this promise to, to bring us salvation, but we misunderstood. We thought it was gonna be, you know, political salvation that we would have our, our land and our, our gover own governance forever. But really it's, it's even more important that, than that. It's bigger than that. He thought that just telling these people this, they would automatically believe, they would automatically become followers of Christ and it didn't happen. And so he's trying to understand why is this happening? And so he spends all three of these chapters, Romans 9 through 11, trying to figure out how the Jews and the rejection of Christ fits in to this new understanding of what God is doing through Jesus. And so he, um, he, he kind of is wrestling with this and, and bringing up different points. And so he talks about, you know, you must share the good news with people if you want them to hear it so that they can confess it. But what do we do with this? How do, what do we do with the people who don't listen, who don't hear it? And he concludes at the end of this little dissertation, little debate, you know, self-debate. In Romans 11, he says, I want you to understand this mystery. A hardening has come upon part of Israel until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So that's his conclusion. He says, it's a mystery. I don't completely understand it. But what I know is, or what I think is that God is um, hardening the hearts of some of Israel so that there is space for Gentiles to believe too, for Gentiles to come in. And then Paul believes that after that time, God will lift this hardening of heart and all of Israel will convert to belief in, in Christ. All Israel will, will fall in line with what God has been doing here. And so he doesn't have to worry anymore about you know, what's gonna happen to, to his brothers and sisters um, who are Jewish and don't, don't believe in this this new information about Jesus. So it's, it's a very different understanding. It's a very different way to read this than to pull it out of context and say, well, this is true you know, now and forever. Paul is talking about a specific trouble that he's having. He's having a, a, a particular situation where his kinspeople are not behaving in the way that he assumed they would behave. Why is that? What is God up to here? And this is how he, this is the conclusion that he comes to. That for him, all Israel be, will be saved because from him, through him, and to him are all things. And that's where, that's where we come up with some of the things that Paul says that kind of point toward universalism. That if all things, all people are from God, through God, and to God then God is going to draw all things toward God, then we kind of all are going to fall into that, regardless of who we are. <clears throat> so I think what we learn from this little exercise and looking at these passages is that evangelism has to be contextual. We can't just pull something out of the Bible or pull something out of our own um, you know, our, our own experience and say, you know, this is, this is what must be done in every situation. Looking, thinking about and looking at context and asking ourselves the question, what do love and good news look like in this situation? We have to remember those origins of the word evangelism, good news. So if we're going to share good news, what is the good news? What is, the, what is this message that we're supposed to be sharing? So I want us to take a look at, what time is it? Um, 
we'll skip one of these, but let's take a look at Matthew 10, um, verses 5 through 8. I don't have it for up on the screen here, but it's not too long. I can read it to you. It says, the 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. So here's this evangelion, the, the, evan the, the, the good news, the, the content of the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. So for Jesus, the good news is twofold. Number one, words. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Number two, action that proves it. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. So who here has done one of those four things this week? I've missed out on that opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I felt, felt bad with muscle spasms in my neck, but I don't think I personally healed it. So, <laughs> so obviously when we read this, literally, this is not, you know, this is not anything that we can, can do with our, our own power and our within, you know, the, the bounds of science. But I think it's a really helpful way to think about this because are we always going, are, are we ever going to raise somebody who has physically died? I don't believe so. I'm not, I'm not planning on that in my lifetime. I might be wrong. You never they know. It. They tried it at Bethel. Yes, didn't work out so well for them. So I don't think that's gonna happen. But in what ways do we raise the dead? Do we bring life where there is hopelessness and helplessness? Do we, you know, do, do we raise the dead um, opportunities of a young person who, you know, is living in poverty and goes to a terrible school and doesn't have any good friends and is involved maybe in gangs or, or something like that. Can we, can we raise the dead opportunities and future of that child? Can we cleanse the lepers? Can we remove stigmas so that people can feel holy, whole and human even within the context of some of the, the behaviors and, and identities that they carry that make them outcasts in their communities and in, in their families and in their societies. And that, you know, that could refer to, um, you know, people who have various um, types of disabilities. It could refer to um, people who um, are, um, you know, are, are, I don't know, like an example, gay, um, you know, gay youth is a huge problem in our country because so many parents reject their children when they come out to them. And so they're homeless and on the street, um, you know, they, they have been cast out. They are considered untouchable by their family. Same thing as a leper. The lepers were, were cast out because they were untouchable. They were unclean. They were not to be part of society. And so no, we don't have lepers. And even if we did, we couldn't, you know, cure, personally cure them, but we have opportunities to do these things. Cast out demons. What are the demons that, you know, the, the people that we love carry with them and how can we help them work through those things? Demons of alcoholism, demons of, um, you know, self-esteem issues, demons of struggles with, um, with work, with re their relationships. These are, I think these are the, the way that we share the good news with the things that we do. But why, I think is what kind of we're missing on, on our side of this. I think that mainline churches have, um, have kind of gotten this idea that evangelism is about what you do. The good news is about what you bring here and now, not just in the future. 
but the words, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Why are we doing this? Because this is a little slice of heaven. This is a little slice of what God intends for the world. So I think that's, that's the question we have to ask. What do love and good news look like? I have a niece whose mother is Chinese and um, her dad is, is my husband's brother. And um, she, it, it occurred to me yesterday that she is constantly searching for reassurance about her appearance mm. because she looks Asian and um, all of the scorn and cruel things that are being done to Asian Americans right now are really affecting her badly, I know. And, and she just needs constant reassurance. She's always posting pictures, selfies on Facebook, wanting people to tell her that she looks really good. Mm -hmm. And I just feel so, so bad for her. But how do you deal with something like that? I mean, that is just in her core that she's not like everybody else, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how to deal with it. And these people around that are just spewing all this hatred, they're not helping anything. Yeah. And yet that, a lot of I think that's them, what it's... A lot of them call themselves Christians. Yeah, so I think that's that's what this contextual evangelism is about. That you know, the, you you understand where this is these these um, you know this kind of we call it fishing sometimes fishing for compliments or fishing for yeah you know, um, and so you see where it's coming from. Some people might say, "Oh, this girl is so vacuous and superficial, and all she cares about is her looks," but you see what's really going on. So I think that's really important. So I think, you know, just helping her, giving her what she needs is a first step. Um, but if you have a, a close enough relationship, you know, you can approach it and you can say, hey, I know that there's been a lot of anti-Asian scary stuff going on in our country lately. How are you doing? How are you handling that? What kind of support do you need? And if she's, you know, if, if you can ask those kinds of questions and if she would, you know, yeah. you in that way. Um, oh yeah, she would then that's, you know, I think that is, that is evangelism. That is sharing good news because there are people out there who understand, who can help her to, to wrestle with some of those feelings that she's having that maybe she doesn't even understand completely herself, that she's just thinking it's, you know, her, her body image, but really it's her fear of, because she looks like these people who are not safe, she's not safe. Yeah. So to help her to kind of navigate some of that, I think would, would be good news for her. But I think yeah. that's, that's what it's about. It's about looking at the situation and saying, what is the good news in this situation? What does love look like in this situation? Doing practical theology is hard. It's a lot harder, I think, than getting out your bullhorn and trying to shove pamphlets into people's hands <laughs> a lot of times. Um, so as we, as we move toward kind of the, the, the conclusion, if you will, of our class for today, I want to challenge you with something and you don't have to agree with me on this, but I was asked, you know, the question for this week is what is evangelism? And we, we've kind of come to the conclusion that it's about love. But to me, I think that the word evangelism has kind of sailed, that ship has sailed. It used to mean good news. Now it means in a lot of time, in a lot of ways, you know, bad news, fear, um, scary stuff. Yeah. And so I would, I would um, encourage you to think about this a little bit. What if we replace the word evangelism with the word justice? What if when we looked at the world and we wondered how we can share the gospel, how we can share that good news, how we can share the message of Christ with the world instead of thinking about that from an, a per, the perspective of evangelism, which carries such so much baggage about, you know, converting people and for, and 
forcing people through fear to under to believe what you believe and to you know join my church and to believe the same thing as me and to say this prayer or you know all these different things what have we thought about it from the perspective of justice and i have a quote to share with you um, from eric Fromm: love is a decision it is a judgment it is a promise love isn't something natural Rather, it requires discipline, concentration, patience, faith, and the overcoming of narcissism. It isn't a feeling, it is a practice. So thinking about love, what, what, would, what would feel like love in this situation is how we do evangelism. Love feels like justice. Love feels like a decision to put the needs of the person that you're working with ahead of your own. Love is the disciplined, intentional choice to work on behalf of someone else. Initial thoughts on that, or do I need to give you a little time to chew on that? I know it's a very different idea. <laughs> <laughs> There's a yeah. lot there. Yeah. All right. Well, we can go on. We can always talk about it more <laughs> next week. I know it's. I know it's new. That's a um, that's a showstopper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So just a, a couple of thoughts on justice, um, because I think we have, you know, we have our definitions of justice. And when I, you know, when we talk about justice in terms of theology, I just want to make sure that we are uh, on the same page. When I talk about justice, I'm not talking about our justice system. You know, I'm not talking about cops and robbers and, and law and order, you know, crime scenes, special victims units, whatever. Our justice system, you know, society's justice system, we decide together as a society, what is an unacceptable behavior? Usually it's because, um, you know, that, that behavior is going to disrupt um, the way that our society is running in some way. And so we kind of come up with this social contract and we decide what is, an, what is unacceptable behavior and what punishments we collectively agree are appropriate when someone violates the social contract that we've got together as a society. And so depending on, you know, how we're interpreting that social contract, depending on how we're interpreting the behavior and the purpose of the behavior or the consequences of the behavior, justice isn't always going to look like justice to everyone, particularly to the person who is dealing with those consequences. But God's definition of justice is different. And this is gonna sound familiar to you if you were part of our um, violence in the Bible class. For God, justice is, everything is where it belongs in the goodness of the created order. No one takes what belongs to God or to someone else, whether it's power or glory or resources. Everything and everyone is where it needs to be, where God created it to be. And so if we use that definition, if we understand justice to be about God's will for the world, ontology, if you will, that we talked about a while back, what you are at the core, what everything is created to be at its core, then the question isn't, how can I convert this person? The question is, how can I act in such a way that will take this person or this situation one step closer to how God envisions it to be, how God created it to be. How can I create justice? How can I do something that sounds like the good news, that looks like love, that brings us closer to God's justice? So what is evangelism? I wanna to toss out this quote. I don't necessarily like this quote very much because it downplays 
the words. And like I said before, I think we mainline churches are really good at um, serving people, but we're not as good at telling them why we're serving them. Uh, but this, this quote is attributed to Francis of Assisi, preach the gospel at all times, use words when necessary. I think that when we live out God's kingdom by doing justice, we are evangelizing because we're announcing the good news of God and God's kingdom by living it out, by showing people what it can look like on, in this world. And I think that, you know, most of the time this looks like meeting basic needs. It looks like fighting for justice within systems that are broken and, and hurting certain populations of people. It looks like showing the world that that decision to love, that, that intentional, disciplined practice of love is God's way of doing things. But it's also, I think, back to that Anglo-Saxon word, God spell. It's about the good story. It's about sharing God's story and it's about sharing how that story intersects with your story, how your story fits into God's story, how God has impacted your story when God's love has come into your life. What, do, what has it looked like in your life when God has interjected that love and God has brought justice? I think to, to me, that is what evangelism is about. So there's my sermon for the day. <laughs> Thoughts, questions, disagreements. No mention of bullhorns. <laughs> no, I do not own a bullhorn. Although sometimes I wish I did when it comes to telling my children that they need to take a shower and go to bed. <laughs> so it's, it's our testimony. It's our, is that what you're saying? But I think, I think it's, yeah, I, I, it's our testimony, but I think it's also why. I think it's our motivation. Are we motivated by our own fear? Are we motivated by trying to get more people in the seats? Are we trying, are we motivated by trying to make more money for our church? Are we try, are we motivated by, you know, trying to add an extra tick on our personal, I've, you know, won this many people for God scoreboard? Or... Are we motivated by the desire to share what we have experienced with other people, to give them a taste of what it's like to live in God's kingdom? Sunflower Jackson Frost. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, Pam, you're muted. <laughs> I think the latter. I mean, you know, I think that UCC's got a, a, a fantastic message and I just, we just want to share that with people as a way of being. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we'd like to keep the church going. We'd like to keep the lights on and the air conditioning running in the <laughs> summertime, you know, but, and we'd like to get a new minister, but yeah, so it's a, it's a good thing. We can't, I can't imagine losing our church Mm -hmm. so. Larry, what do you think? Well, I think the, the only way you can truly talk about it is through your own experience. You can't be out there talking about others' experience. You gotta be talking about your own. So I tend to see how it intersects with my story because it is my story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I share my stories a lot. Probably people don't even want to hear them, but um, I, I like to share my story if I think it will help the person that I'm talking to 
with a problem or an issue that they might have. Mm -hmm. um, to give them my example and and what has happened to me, you know, as um, a result. So um, I don't think that I I say things like that just to make myself feel better. I think I'm actually trying to to be a good a good news evangelist. <laughs> yes. And you don't even have to have a bullhorn. No. Those are no, usually it's usually it's hard. one to one. It's probably more effective that way. I think so. And you might not, you know, it might not result in another butt in the seat. It might not result in more money in the coffers of the church. It might not result in you know, a, a, a public or, um, you know, major transformational moment for that person where they suddenly come to Christ and in, in that, you know, praying the sinner's prayer kind of way. But they've experienced God. And I think that message is inescapable. That message is, that, that to me is what that, that to me is why I'm not worried about the question that we asked last week about free will, because I think if, if the real message is out there, the real good news told to the people in the way that they can hear it as good news and see it as good news and experience it as good news, I don't think, I, I think that that is inescapable. I think that is the the unrejectable love of God that we, we, we have no choice. Cause why would you, why would you reject that when it's the real message? But I can definitely see why you would reject it when people are, you know, on their bullhorn screaming about hell. Yeah. Takes less paper that way too. This is true. Video. I don't have to make any pamphlets. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that guy was using his work, his work printer to do that too, his work copier. Not cool. I was man. hoping he owned the business. <laughs> <laughs> Not cool, man. Yeah, so feeling, on top of, feeling from work. Was, on top of his bullhorn. It was after, <laughs> after <laughs> hours. It was after five o'clock, just the clock. Yeah. If he brought his own stealing. paper. If he brought his own paper and threw five dollars in for the toner. <laughs> All right. So next week we're going to talk about good people and bad people. We're going to talk about whether God rewards good people and punishes bad people. We're going to talk about the prosperity gospel. We're going to talk maybe a little bit about the odyssey why do bad things happen to good people hey pat you made it just for the very end <laughs> so anything else good to people say today? Have bad. pat no, just remember i she won't be here next week neither will i so so for right now pat you need to um you need to answer this question for us since you missed class <laughs> Does God reward good people and punish bad people? I think we re I think he rewards all of us and we punish ourselves. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, good. Man. I sh I'm going to have to take that recording and put it in the class next week. <laughs> it's a good one. Talking. All right. Any final thoughts for this week? Yeah, thank, thank you for that. That was very uh, enlightening, the stuff that you showed today. Yeah, let me know. The video, uh, the video was good. Good. That was fun. Good. Let me know if you come up with any thoughts about that justice thing, because I know it's a very different idea to that, uh -oh. even, that evangelism is justice. The more bizarre one was the definition of love that had us all stopped. <laughs> 
All right. Well, let me know if you have any additional thoughts about that. And I can address, we can address those next week or the week after if you're not going to be here next week. Otherwise, have a wonderful week.